Hello, everyone. As I mentioned last week, I'm taking my mid-season break this week, so there is no new episode. What there is is an unlocked MAUB episode. Now, this episode was previously released as Monsters Among Us Beyond, number 47. Now, I'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. But until then, please, enjoy Monsters Among Us Beyond, number 47. Good evening and welcome to Monsters Among Us Beyond, number 47. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Hello gang, and welcome back. It's been a spell since we've rendezvoused at these coordinates. Now I have a great little show lined up for you guys this evening. One that is jam-packed full of all sorts of ghost creatures and other unsolved mysteries. So let's waste no time in getting started. To kick us off this evening, please welcome Aaron from the state of Oregon to the program. Hi, Derek. My name is Aaron. I'm from Michigan. I'm currently moving up to Oregon. I'm calling because just listening to season nine, episode 13, and catching up, and you featured a story that came from Milford, Michigan, and I lived about 10 minutes from Milford before we moved out to Oregon. So my husband was telling me that while we were dating out in Novi, Michigan, which is about a half an hour or so away from Milford, we had just gotten out of a movie. I went one way, he was taking another car, going another way, and but he had to go and uh, use the bathroom first. So he went out uh, to the back of the lot at the uh, theaters, out in Novi, and if you're from the area, you'll know what theater I'm talking about, and went kind of into the forest, and he kept hearing people, kept hearing, kept meeting people, and didn't want to get caught. So he went into the forest to relieve himself, and was standing there, and it got really, really quiet, and he heard like a loud thump, and he said that the, the tree shook, and it really just scared the, scared the bejesus out of him. Um, and so he like paused, you know, he said that he was like still like half peeing, like like just paused, just scared, like, um, and he heard another thump, and that tree shook again, so he started to back out, just like that story that you featured in season 13, like, that that father did, just started to back out real slowly and walked away, so I had heard that, and I wanted to let you know, and then I went and told my husband about hearing that story about the man in Milford, Then he told me, too, that he had a co-worker who lived in Milford, who uh, him and a bunch of his neighbors kept hearing like screaming, like a screaming, just like a horrible, eerie screaming noise, like in the woods and stuff nearby their home in Milford. So all the neighborhood, everybody was out trying to find this. They called the cops. I um, mean, a cop even got spooked and pulled out her weapon, thinking that like something was going on. Supposedly, the cover story was that nearby is the GM proving ground. And it was winter, I guess, when it happened. So they said that the snow plows, the rubber edges on the snow plows were creating these screeching noises. But I thought, you know, it was a really good cover story. But I wanted to let you know because I never hear stories from Michigan. And it was amazing to hear that one from Milford and uh, super exciting to uh, get my husband involved and all of that. Definitely would be interested to hear more about if, if anybody else has had weird stuff happen in, in Milford since it seems to be a tiny little bit of a hot spot. 
thanks again for everything that you do, for everything that all of your mods and admins do, and all of your help. And look forward to more podcasts and more stories. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Now, I'll be honest, Milford, Michigan was not on my radar. Now, I scoured through my archives in search of some sort of info on this small town, but I was disappointed to find very little. Now, I did learn, however, that Milford does host a ghost tour. For 18 bucks, you can walk the historic streets and hear tales of a distraught, ghostly mother who killed her two sons, or tales of curses on Charles Island and the accused witch buried in the Milford Cemetery. Now, a lot of these little towns have these tours, and I highly, highly suggest checking one out on your next getaway. Not only are they a great way to directly fund paranormal research and media, but they're also a ton of fun. Now, as for the sound that Aaron heard, now it's tough to say, but given the circumstance, I think getting spooked is certainly the correct response. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that the following candidate is responsible for any of these sounds, but I think it's important to point out that Michigan is dogman country. Now, thanks again for calling in and sharing your experience. And speaking of odd sounds in the night, here with this week's rebuttal is Antonio from the Golden State of California. Hey, Derek, this is Antonio. I've called in a couple of times. I'm calling because I heard your season 10, the latest episode just before the round table. And one of your callers called in and said that he had heard a noise saying California while him and his buddy were out camping. And it kind of freaked me out because I remember calling in a couple of years ago and telling you about how I was in Azusa Canyon. And I go coyote hunting and whatnot there in that area up in Hinkley, California. I don't know if you know what it's familiar with, but I've gone coyote hunting and that howl that he was sharing was eerily reminiscent of what I heard when I was in Azusa Canyon backpacking up by Fisherman's Hook out the bridge to nowhere that night. I just wanted to let call in as it just kind of creeped me out to hear finally a recording of something that I heard back then. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. That call went a different direction than I thought it would. I half expected Antonio to explain the sounds away for us, not to confirm them and further validate their importance. Just to catch everyone up, here are the sounds Antonio was referring to, courtesy of Stargell Blackstar on YouTube. Now, like I always say, it's easy for me to sit in my comfy studio and dismiss some of these spooky sounds as known animals or other explained phenomena, but it's another situation when you're actually out there, alone in the darkened forest with whatever is making this sound. Thanks again, Antonio. Now, if you have a story you would like to hear shared on the show, simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Now, next up, we meet up with Josh from Parts Unknown. My name is Josh. I have a few uh, paranormal stories for you I'm going to give you, and you can play them in whatever order that you like, but I'm going to start from the beginning. When I was in about seventh grade, I, uh, I kept hearing about these kids playing Ouija board and they're just coming back with all these wild stories and kind of ghost stories about all the stuff that was happening at the girl's house where they were playing it. So I kind of wanted in. I'm a naturally curious person. 
And my number one thing I wanted to do was just test this thing because everybody was so adamant about it and how it worked and there's ghosts and the Oracle spells things. And I just, I thought it was so fascinating. This is before the age of the internet. So I couldn't really just like look it up. I had to see it for myself. So I go to this girl's house and I'm watching uh, them play. And I remember at one point, you know, I asked if I could play and it was just doing like the typical, I think stuff that kind of comes from our own consciousness, you know, my house, get out, blah, blah, blah. And I put my hands on, and I remember feeling almost like a tapping at the bottom of the Oracle. And it was almost like, uh, it was literally like somebody went on the underside of the Oracle and tapped on it a couple of times. And I said, hmm, that's weird. And I remember it kind of going, and I don't remember what it said, but I remember it started to get a lot more complicated. Uh, the stuff that it was saying, even in my seventh grade mind, I said, hmm, it would take a lot for a group of people to collectively come up with this stuff and then uh, spell it out and make it happen. And it, it seems strange. So I go, you know, let me really give this thing a test. I said, I'm going to go in the other room and I'm going to touch something. And I want you guys to tell me what I'm touching. Ask the Oracle or whatever this thing is. Say, you know, what is Josh touching right now? So the girls agree and I go in the other room and I put my hand on the fridge. I'm in the kitchen. And I go, okay, go. And uh, they start spelling out as it's spelling. They go F L O R I D. A, Florida. And I go, ha, uh, that's ridiculous. I'm touching a fridge. And I look at my hand, and my hand is touching a magnet, and the magnet is in the shape of Florida and says Florida across it. Uh, I immediately looked. Uh, I looked out the window behind me. I looked to my right in the living room. There's nobody there. I went into the room, and I was almost angry uh, because what had just happened was so inexplicable. That's the first of uh, a long journey and uh, sequence of events having to do with the paranormal. So I'll call on with another one. Thank you, Josh. And I'll tell you this. That may be one of the best Ouija board stories I've heard to date. You know, apart from some complicated scheme to trick the new boy, I really can't see many other logical possibilities here. Now, as I've expressed on the show in the past, I love the lore and aesthetic of the Ouija board but I really don't put a lot of stock in them, as far as paranormal activity goes. Now Josh here is doing his best to challenge that belief, and for that, we thank you. Now folks, for this next one, we venture to the state of New Jersey. Stephen, please, tell us what you experienced. How you doing? My name is Steven. I called before regarding my incident that happened in the Bronx, New York. Well, yeah, my name is Steven. I'm calling from Jersey. After revenge listening to your podcast, it made me think of another situation that happened in 2018. So November 11, 2018 was my cousin's wedding. After the wedding, I was going to go back to the hotel and stay, get some sleep, and then head back to New Jersey. Long story short, there was a bomb threat on the hotel that we were staying at, and they ended up finding an actual pipe bomb. So I just told my cousin, you know what, instead of me waiting here a few hours to get some sleep, I'm just going to go to Walmart, get some energy drinks, and just hit the road and just go. I'll be all right. I'm used to driving this, you know, lane. So I did so. After me listening to music, because I was tired of listening to music for two hours, I turned the radio, I turned my phone off, and I put the radio on. I went to go hit scan because I didn't know what radio stations there were, and I accidentally hit AM as I hit scan. So when I'm scanning it, the first radio station that comes on is these two gentlemen, and they're talking about aliens. And as I'm listening to the gentleman talk, I'm, I'm happy to look up in the sky, and it's a clear sky in North Carolina. And I look up, it looked to me, it looked like two shooting stars. So I didn't pay no mind, I'm just thinking it's the shooting star, it was just weird couple miles up the road I'm driving and then this truck gets off the exit and then comes on the highway with me and it's just me and this truck and the truck to me looked like he was carrying like a rocket ship I took pictures of it it could have been a plane but to me it didn't look like no no plane like it had like a rocket ship look to it it didn't have no wings like that it had other pieces that was on the trailer alongside of it but the piece had to be at least I want to say 15 foot long so it was like a real small, in a sense, rocket ship, like someone, like a homemade, I guess. But it was just weird. It was a weird coincidence that, you know, me listening to the radio station talking about aliens, and then I, I happen to look up in the sky, and then I see that, and then this truck gets on the highway, which to me looked like a rocket ship. 
So I just figured I'd let that, you know, out and let everybody know. Thank you, and I uh, appreciate your podcast. Have a good one. Thank you, Stephen. Now, I swear we've heard a story on a past episode that was eerily similar to Stephen's. In fact, I even remember playing a clip. It might have even been this clip via ABC News out of the Kansas area. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to lock down the source. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's a UFO. Residents in Cowley County still talking about a mystery craft being seen towed down U.S. 77 yesterday. It was a sight that, for some, won't be forgotten anytime soon. Sitting inside Lindley's appliance store, Cami Root is used to seeing large machinery towed down U.S. 77. Yeah, it sure caught my attention. But what she saw Monday afternoon is something she won't soon forget. There is this funny sphere that went through on this big trailer. And my first thought was, that looks like a UFO. A huge 32-foot craft of some sort, wrapped in tarp and as mysterious as the transport company who called Sheriff Don Reed for help. They uh, told us that it was uh, an aircraft and that they had explored other ways of transporting it, but this was the best way for them to do it. And uh, they asked us not to say a whole lot about it. After all, the massive load's shape would certainly draw enough attention on its own. Now, in reality, that craft was an experimental drone being shipped to Maryland. And which you saw, Stephen. I can't help but wonder if it may have been a disassembled wind turbine. Sometimes those things can appear pretty alien, especially on a flatbed truck. Then again, I suppose there's always a possibility that it was aliens. So thanks again, Stephen, for sharing. Oh, and way to gloss over the scariest part of the story. A pipe bomb. That's truly spooky. You know, I'm still thinking about that Ouija board entry that Josh sent in. So let's get wild and try another Ouija tale out. This one, courtesy of Jacob in Missouri. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob from Missouri. I just got to say before I say anything else, I love your show and uh, a buddy of mine ended up showing me your show a couple months ago and I absolutely love it. But this story ended up happening to me and a couple of my friends whenever we were using a Ouija board. It was about June or July of 2018. We've used Ouija boards before, but we we kind of got a few different things that happened, but nothing really major. But this last time that we ended up using a Ouija board, we ended up stopping completely because this incident happened. So on this night, we think we went out at like 10 o'clock at night, and we went to this place near where I live um, in St. Charles uh, called Chesterfield, Missouri. And when we went out there, we went with me and my buddy and my nephew and a friend that uh, one of my buddies met. And we went out to this shack that we had been out to before, and we didn't ever get anything the last time we went there. And we ended up going there and we sat down and we had like a bunch of candles and stuff like that. And we set them around the Ouija board and we were pretty much asking questions and, you know, all this other stuff pretty much waiting. And we'd probably answered questions for like 30 minutes and nothing happened. So, you know, we started seeing the candles started like pointing towards the board. And, you know, this time we still didn't have any answers from the actual pointer. So we saw that the candles were freaking out, so we put them to the side. And we put all the candles to the side, and we started asking more questions, and we saw that, you know, the candles were kind of like flickering to every question I asked. So I told the thing whenever I was asking the questions that if the answer was yes, make the, you know, candles go crazy, and if it's no, just keep the candles still. So every question that we asked, when it was a yes, it would kind of go crazy. If it was no, it would stay still. So I thought some of my buddies for a while were messing with me. So I told them to look up like, you know, away from the candles and I kind of blew on it and they weren't moving. And then I blew on it harder. And then the candles were actually reacting to me trying to blow on them. So I, we were kind of all freaking out like, well, this is real. So we were asking questions, you know, if it was born here and, you know, we asked it how it died, which is a pretty stupid question I realized at the time. But uh, after asking a numerous amount of questions and asking if it had, you know, families, because the questions that we had answers to, we could only get a yes or no from the candles because it wouldn't communicate with the board. 
But after a while of us asking questions, uh, we realized one question that they asked, well, that I asked one of the other people in our group realized that it was a, I kind of repeated a question by accident and she kind of picked up on it and realized that it gave a completely different answer. So after that moment, it was completely quiet outside, nothing like there was no wind blowing that night. And as soon as after when we asked that question, she realized something was wrong. We heard four loud footsteps outside of the door, like coming around the corner to the shack. And it sounded like cracking in leaves. And it sounded like someone was wearing boots and it came right to the door and we all freaked out. And the the girl, though, who was sitting close to the door didn't hear anything. So we were all confused on how she couldn't hear any of it. But as soon as that happened, we grabbed the board, we blew out the candles, and we straight booked through the door. Because, I mean, the, the footsteps were right outside of the door whenever, you know, it ended up stopping. And there was no sound at all out there. So we booked it back to the car and, you know, left. And that was the last experience with that. Because we stopped using the board after that night since it freaked us out so bad. So I appreciate, you know, listening to the story. And uh, I think you're really doing a great job with your show. And talk to you later. Thanks, Jacob. Another great call. You know, I find it curious that we hear the same elements in all these Ouija board stories. Candles flickering, odd communication, and eventually footsteps to the front door. Now, I grew up hearing a very similar story from my aunt, whom apparently summoned my great-grandfather one rainy night back in the 60s. So is it cliche because these tricks are old hat and most of us have caught on. Or are these stories repetitive because the experiences seem to be cookie cutter in nature? But regardless of all that, I think the Ouija board is a beautiful work of art. So thank you again, Jacob, for telling us about your experience. Now on to something almost as strange as seeing your own face on a t-shirt. A disappearing car. Please welcome Jake from the Buckeye State of Ohio to the program. Uh, hey, Derek. It's Jake from Ohio here. I've called in a few other times. I was on the uh, Doorsman episode, which was really good, by the way. Uh, it was a great episode. But anyway, uh, it's my last story that I really have. I used to go to school at uh, Bowling Green State University, if anyone knows where that is. It's on the very western side of Ohio. And it was about a three-hour drive for me to get from there to home. And I made the trip, you know, semi-regularly every month or so. And one time, I believe it was early November of 2017, and I was coming back from my house, back up to school. I'm driving on 75. 75 goes through a lot of places, but it's really, really just one straight line right from, you know, speaking in Ohio, Cincinnati to Toledo and BG is on the way. So that's the road I was on and clear night, you know, I mean, it was cold, but you know, no fog or anything. It was probably, it was dark. So it was probably around 9 PM and I'm um, driving no one else on the road where you're, you know, sometimes when you're driving on that road, you won't see people for a while. And so I'm just driving along. It's dark and in the distance behind me in my rear view, I see headlights and they're coming really fast. And, these headlights, you know, I'm you know, wondering what's going on. Hopefully they're going to pass me. You know, maybe it's just some guy really driving fast. But these lights came up still. I mean, I would say they're going probably 80 to 90 miles an hour. I was probably going about 75 or 80. And this thing just caught up with me. And I thought I was going to die. I thought this car was going to ram right into my, you know, in the backside of my car. And these lights come up. I braced for the impact and nothing nothing i looked around there was no other cars on the road and uh, i was really freaked out and you know i, I mean i they would have had to i don't know how a car could have faked that i really don't i mean it was crazy and then 20 minutes later the exact same thing happened same thing i saw the lights in the distance they came up right when they were about to hit me you know nothing they just shut off like a light switch and, uh, but there were no other lights anywhere on the road. I didn't hear any cars. I mean, I, I really have no idea what this could have been. You know, maybe some sort of, like, ghost of a car crash. But uh, it was it really freaked me out at the time. Uh, and it still kind of freaks me out 
That's one of the weirdest things that ever have happened to me. Uh, thanks again, Derek, and uh, hope to hear this on the show. Bye. Thanks, Jake. And roll along and fight for BGSU. You know, class of 2005 here. And as a former Ohioan that spent six years in that part of the state, I know I-75 quite well. Now, not that I think that it relates to the story, but the infamous Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is actually located just off that stretch of interstate. Now, I had my fair share of odd occurrences on my late-night drives from Bowling Green to my hometown. I once made it home on only half a tank of gas. No idea how that happened. You know, it typically took me a full tank each way. Something tells me that if I could have figured out how that happened, that knowledge could come in handy these days. But as for Jake's mystery headlights, the only logical conclusion I could muster here is that maybe the glass of the vehicle and the angle of headlights behind Jake's car created the perfect illusion, making it appear as though the lights were fastly approaching. Sort of like the camera obscura effect. And for those not familiar, it's essentially a darkened box or even a room with one small hole facing a lighted source. The light projects the image of the outside world through that tiny hole and into the side of the box. Or in this case, Jake's car. But this is a theory only. Although I can say that once when I had a basement apartment, in Bowling Green no less, I accidentally recreated the camera obscura effect by blocking out my windows with holy trash bags. But again, this is only a theory, so swallow it with a grain of salt. Now, of course, this could be something akin to what Jake suggested, something more ghostly in nature. Either way, thanks, Jake, for the entry. Now, I told you guys this episode was jam-packed, and, and I was not kidding. We are nowhere near the bottom of this blood-curdling barrel. But to get us one step closer, please welcome the following anonymous caller to the show. Hey, Derek. Just wanted to submit this story. Uh, happened um, sometime around May of 2018, I was uh, working in the U.S. Virgin Islands on the island of St. Thomas, and uh, I was living in one of the uh, resorts uh, on the island. Uh, a lot of the government contractors working on the uh, storm recovery after Irma and Maria uh, were living in these hotels. And so this one hotel was full of contractors. It's a relatively new place. It was nice, but we were working long 12 hour days, so it was tiring. It was, just, uh, it was nice to go back to uh, a nice hotel. I was there for two months. Uh, I was in one room and then got moved to another run around May of 2018. And uh, one evening, it was probably around two o'clock in the morning, I'm sleeping in um, this king bed. You know, every day the, the sheets get changed, so the, the sheets are nice and tight. And I remember lying on my back and um, feeling, um, when I went to bed, uh, the sheets, you know, they're they're tightly around my feet that were pointing up. So, you know, I could feel the pressure on the tops of my toes and the, the bottoms of my feet were, were pointing outward. So not too far from the edge of the bed, which is probably about two, two and a half feet off the ground. But one night around two in the morning, I feel like something took two fingers and tapped fairly hard the instep of one of my feet. It, it was really weird. It, it just felt like someone had tapped my instep. It wasn't anything hitting my foot. It wasn't anything falling. It wasn't anything, you know, a sheet moving because there was just a sheet over my feet. It was something that tapped my foot. And I woke up, turned on the light, looked around, freaked out. So... I go back to bed, and um, probably a week later, same side of the bed, again, lying on my back, uh, long days working, and I, I guess I, I, I went to bed with uh, on my back, and I, I remember, uh, I think I rolled over onto my side, so my back was pointing to the edge of the bed, I, was, uh, I turned to the left, so my back's to the edge of the bed, my, my feet are pointing towards the middle of the bed, and probably around the same time, around 2, 3 in the morning, I feel 
again, something like two fingers, but this time in the middle of the small of my back. And again, it, it, it wasn't like anything I've ever felt before. I mean, if it, I, I know what someone tapping me feels like. Again, nothing's in the room. Uh, I, I was I was kind of freaked out, and so I had mentioned to my my fiance. Uh, uh, well, actually, my girlfriend at the time. My fiance is telling her over the phone that these things happen. Now she's a complete skeptic, and she blew it off completely. But eventually, a week later, she came down to stay with me. And we went scuba diving during the day, and then in the afternoon, came back, and around 4 or 5 in the afternoon, we went to, to bed to, to take a nap because we were tired in the afternoon. And she's lying on the spot where I would lay, and I'm on the opposite side of this king bed. And uh, this time, I'm turned towards her again, so my back is facing to the edge of the bed. I'm facing towards her back as she's pointing the other direction. And this time, while we're both in the bed, this is probably around 4 or 5 in the afternoon, I feel something tap me on my butt. I mean, again, it's like two fingers just like hitting me. And I jump up and I go, come on! And I wake my my girlfriend up and I go, it happened again. It happened again. I cannot believe this. And she sees how freaked out I am and goes, come on, you didn't feel a thing. It freaked me out. I mean, this is about three times in three weeks. I'll say after she left, uh, every night I kept the lights on. I, I, I couldn't go back to sleep. I had a hard time sleeping. I, I eventually left a, a month later. So, I mean, all I can say is uh, we were working a lot of heavy hours, and maybe I had a few drinks after work, and, and I, I've had problems sleeping before. I know what it's like to be restless in my sleep, and uh, uh, all I can say is I don't know what was hitting me and it it, you know by the height of the bed and either someone's hanging their arm and tapping me with two fingers or it's someone short like a child hitting me on the foot I I, all I know is (laughs) it was distinct it wasn't really in my mind I I, I'm pretty sure I, I I was not dreaming this I'll just say, um, you know, uh, I'm sure these resort hotels have plowed over somebody's home or somebody's place or somebody's property at some point. So I can't say for sure what was in this area. I, I know around it there are relatively poor houses, and I'm sure this is what was there. If not farms were there, sugar plantations or the like were there. But um, so who knows what past. Uh, that uh, land had but I'll tell you I've always been a believer in this stuff but I never thought it would happen to me I know something was tapping me so I just wanted to let you know that story Uh, I've always wanted to call in and tell it just uh, thanks for letting me tell the story Uh, I love your podcast and uh, I hope you are able to use this story thanks a lot thanks caller You know, that's the trouble with ghosts. They never seem to know their boundaries. And I was actually quick to dismiss this one as a muscle spasm at first. I experienced that tapping sensation on my leg and my shoulder from time to time. Now it's the tiny, involuntary contraction of one of the muscles. And I'll be damned if it doesn't feel exactly like a finger poking you. Especially when it happens on my shoulder. But our caller claimed that the sensation occurred in different places each time it occurred, which at least to me could suggest it's not some sort of chronic muscle spasm. So if that's not what it is, we're merely left with a few other possibilities. But I'll let you fill in the blanks on those. And thank you again, caller, for sharing that amazing tale. Now for this next entry, we make tracks for the state of Florida where Tara is waiting with her tail. Hi, my name is Tara. I had a weird story that happened to me when I was 12 years old. The year was 1992, and I was going to a summer church camp for a week. The church was in Orlando, and we went to the camp in Jekyll Island. I was the youngest in the youth group then, and my sister went with me, and most of the other kids were more like 
15 to 17 and I was 12. So once we got to the camp, we stayed in, they were kind of like condos. So they were townhouses. Each one had its own entrance. The front door was the only access to get in to the condo. So, and it was upstairs and downstairs condo. So we stayed, all the girls stayed in one condo together and the boys stayed in another one. And this was a huge church camp. There were, you know, hundreds of teenagers there. So one night I was sleeping upstairs with a bunch of other girls and went to bed just like any other normal night. And that night I actually woke up and I I guess had slept walked. I'm not really sure what happened, but I woke up and I was actually on the rocks where the beach was, where the water was standing on it no shoes Um, at Jekyll Island there's really no beach there it's just rocky area last thing I knew I went to sleep in my bedroom surrounded by a whole bunch of people sharing one room and then I wake up on these rocks in the middle of the night I was really frazzled I didn't know what had happened so I started walking back to the condo I remember my feet hitting the puddles in the parking lot walking through here's where the weird part is Uh, And I had been known to sleepwalk before, but the weird part is when I got back to the condo, I knocked on the front door and it was locked. It was dead bolted from the inside. So I don't know how I got out. So I banged on the door for a while, which really scared everyone else that was in the condo because they all were like, what the heck is she doing outside? So after they opened the deadbolt, they saw me out there and they were like, what? happened to you? Where were you? And I was like, I have no idea. I don't know how I got outside, but I just was quite a bit of ways, you know, maybe a hundred yards away. And I still have no idea how I got outside. That was the only access was the front door. I haven't had a whole lot of sleepwalking incidences since then, but that one definitely stands out and I have no clue. So that is it. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Now, I'm honestly not sure which is spookier. The thought of this being the byproduct of some alien abduction process. Or that you somehow escaped through a window and walked to the rocks all in your own accord. Either scenario is enough to keep anyone up at night. So thank you again, Tara, for sharing it with us. Now we're finally making our way to the bottom. And the first of the final two comes to us out of the Lone Star State of Texas. Please... Join me in welcoming James to the program. Hey, Derek. James again from Texas. Wanted to tell you an outdoor story. I was kind of lead researcher in the Grand Teton National Park for a couple of years back in college. It was kind of a big research internship that I did, and it was in the study of um, urban forest ecology. A lot of the research I was doing was looking at tree and forest regeneration, uh, how the wildlife were using the park and how it affected, you know, how that regeneration was affecting tourists, you know, movement in the park and the, the, all those kind of things. And so anyway, I found myself in the backcountry several times, most of my time. I, I was actually in the Grand Teton Park. The first research one was in 2010, and I was there for 11 weeks going all through the backcountry. And so I was by myself quite a bit, and I had several experiences, but one of them that I wanted to tell you about, this was kind of the beginning of my research. I think it was a couple weeks in, and it was during the day, and so, but at this point, I was still driving down to the dirt roads, the park roads, and stopping, uh, doing tree counts and seedling counts, so I'd do a, a random plot survey and would have to just go and count the the saplings that were coming up with the seedlings and stuff like that to look at regeneration. And I went to this one area that had been burned. And now to give you an idea, to kind of give you a visual, the areas I were, that I was in, they were burned back in the, in the 80s. And so there was a massive wildfire that happened in the 80s that burned a lot of the Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone. So the trees are still charred. So, the, you know, they still have soot and char on the trees on the bark in these areas because these were the hottest areas that I was going to and one site was sticks out of my head still to today I parked the truck and again I was by myself 
and I'd go out and do a random plot and right when I got out of the truck, it just kind of felt weird, uh, you know, when you when you get out. And I've been to several plots. I've already I had already done quite a few up to this point, but this one just it was just different. It felt weird. Anyway, so I went and made my plot and started doing my counts. And in the peripheral vision, you start seeing movement. And of course, there's bears there. There's you know all kinds of different wildlife there. And so you always want to be cognizant of, you know, your surroundings. And so I started seeing movement in my peripherals. Well, I started looking, you know, you can't really see. Now, most, to kind of give you another visual, the areas, you don't get a lot. You should get some shrubby vegetation, but it's mostly your trees. So there's not a lot of hiding places in in the shrubs that are there. You can see through them. They're willows. And so you can see through them fairly well. Uh, A lot of bear do like the willow areas, but... You know, you can see them moving, you know, around. Anyway, I started getting movement, and so it was just kind of weird. And, you know, I tried to, you know, I looked, didn't see anything, went back to doing what I was doing. I uh, kept getting movement, and I, and it just started feeling, you know, you get that hair on the back of your neck standing up. You just know something is around you, and so something is watching you. And I was watching these. I was seeing these, and I was like, all right, I, I've got to finish this up quick. So so I tried to finish it up real quick, my count, but still make it somewhat accurate. And my way back to the truck, because I hiked probably about maybe a quarter mile in, uh, I still felt like somebody was around me. I felt like somebody was kind of poking in or, you know, around the trees. And I don't know, it was just, you know, you just feel like somebody's following you. You're always looking behind your back. It was just one of those feelings. And anyway, I get back to the truck. I see the truck in the distance. I'm like, oh, okay, Whew, God, good. I'm still feeling it, feeling it, but you know, when you see the truck at the end of the trail, you're like, yes, I'm almost there. The truck itself is a university truck, so it's white with a big white camper on it. So I open up tailgate, unload the gear, and just just, I guess, just getting there and getting unloaded. Anyway, so I I started walking around the truck and I started noticing different things. And I started looking closer and there are handprints all over the truck, which is odd because, I mean, this is out in in a park road. There's no trails nearby. The park roads are closed to pedestrian traffic. So nobody should have been out there. I mean, if they were, they'd gotten way off the trail or, you know, whatever, whatever. But there are so many handprints and they were, they were human hand. They weren't like a Bigfoot hand or anything like that. They were human hand. But what was so odd and what made it so, I guess, scary at the moment was that those handprints were black. So they were from the char around the trees. And so, you know, everything started putting together. I'm like, that's what I said. You know, there were, must have been something, you know, or I guess spirits or ghosts or whatever you want to call them. There was something that were hiding around those trees, and I guess they were putting their handprint, you know, hands on the tree. And then, anyway, man, it was just, it was freaky. And I got the crap out of there, and I didn't go back to that that area for the rest of my my uh, my stay. So um, anyway, that was one of the experiences I had. It was it was freaky, but I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you can use it, and talk to you later. Thanks, James. Well, that's a wild experience. I can certainly agree. Creepy as well. Now, my first thought is, why? You know, if someone did manage to make it all that far into the wilderness, why would they then mess with a park vehicle? Then, of course, you have the option that whomever did this may actually live out in this area, maybe even within the park, perhaps even off-grid. Now, I know there are legends of feral humans calling remote portions of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park home, and there are even disappearances attributed to this legend. And of course, there's the thought that ghosts are somehow involved here, and I can't help but correlate the handprints with the symbolism of many Native American groups around the continent. There are plenty of examples of warriors putting handprints on their horses before battle. And lastly, I don't want to dismiss the possibility of Sasquatch as quickly as James did. If Bigfoot is a real creature, one would have to assume that it has to reproduce. So perhaps this is merely the work of a juvenile of the species. That could certainly explain the playful graffiti and the human-sized handprints. 
No, I'm afraid I only have questions here, James. But maybe a listener has some info that they can contribute. But until then, thanks again for sharing the amazing tale. And here we are, folks, our final stop on this little ride. And this last one is actually a bit of a double feature. Hailing from the Show Me State of Missouri, please welcome Dee Dee to the program. Hi, Derek. I just started listening to your podcast, and I'm trying to get caught up on all of them because I really enjoy listening to them. And I decided that because I only have two encounters, I was going to share them with you to see if you could use them. I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and we lived in a small town near there, New Haven, Indiana. It was kind of a rural area just outside of Fort Wayne. And my first encounter happened when I was 11 years old. It was during late summer of 1967. My mom and I were driving back, and it was at nighttime from her brother's house, and he also lived on the outskirts of town, about 50 miles from our house. And we were listening to our favorite radio station. We hadn't met any cars as we were going home, and then all of a sudden our radio just cut out, and our car was lit up from above. And at first I thought it was like a helicopter with a spotlight. Then it moved out to the right of our car, and Mom said, I'm going to get home now, and she sped up. But it seemed to keep right up with us, all the way back to our house. And as we pulled into our driveway, it moved out into an open field in front of our house. So we got out of the car, and we looked at it, kind of so we could see it better and see if we could figure out what it was. And we ended up watching it for about an hour just to see what it was going to do next. It was kind of a circular shape, and the edges of the craft was kind of lit up, and the colors of the lights kind of changed from a white to a blue, and then a purple, and we were kind of mesmerized by it. Well, the next thing we know, a police car drove in our driveway, and the officer got out of his car. He looked at the craft, then he looked at us, and he asked us, how long had we been seeing it there? And I told him, well, it followed us home, and I laughed. And he called the station and reported it, and I could hear him reporting it over the radio. And he told him that he was observing the craft, and he could not identify it. And then I heard the response on the radio that they were going to call the airport nearby to see if it showed up on their radar. It was then that I noticed that our neighbors down the road were standing outside. I think they were the ones that called the police. And after about another, I heard helicopters approaching. And then all of a sudden, as soon as they got very close, the craft just zipped up in the air and was gone like in seconds. Well, we went to bed, and the next morning there was a knock at our door. And my mom answered the door, and I rushed in to stand beside her to see who it was. And I remember it was a guy dressed in a military uniform. Very serious expression on his face. He told my mom that the episode that took place last night was under investigation And because of it being a government investigation, we should not talk about it to anyone. Not until the investigation was complete. My mom nodded her head and she shut the door. She turned to me and very quietly said, you heard him. Don't say anything to anyone. And I didn't. But I sure did have an ominous feeling that bad things could happen if I did. And my second encounter happened after we moved from Indiana to a farm in the central part of Wisconsin. We lived on about 120 acres, and it was almost all woods, all except for a lane that drove about a half a mile down to where the opening was in the woods where our house and our barn was. This happened in about 1974, and I was a junior in a small high school. We had one milk cow, and the rest were beef cows in the field. And I usually milked the cow in the morning before I went to school, and then my dad did the nighttime milking. Well, this time, my dad had gone on an overnight trip, so I had to do the nighttime milking. And it was kind of later than I usually did it because I stayed after school for a football game. And so it was about 8 o'clock, and it was very dark, and the barn was quite a ways away from the house, 
So I'm very used to animal noises that are out there in the woods at night because we had gone to Canada several times. And I had just finished the milking and was walking up the driveway to the house. And I noticed all of a sudden it was very quiet, like there was no frog sound, no hoot owl, nothing. It was dead still. And I'll tell you, I got goosebumps. And then I got a chill that something was not right. I felt like something was watching me. So I stopped walking. And all of a sudden, there came a deep, gruddle howl that caused my heart to jump in my chest. And I could tell by that sound that it was huge. And it was nothing, I mean nothing, that I had ever heard before. And so I beat it for the house, and I got inside, and I put a chair in front of the door. But I did not sleep that night, oh, I tell you. And so I went to school the next day, and I was kind of like still shook up, and my friend, a Native American that lived in the area, picked up on that. And she says to me, what's up? You see a ghost? I shook my head and I said, no, let me tell you about it. And after I told her, she got really quiet. And she said, tell me again just where you live. So I told her, I said, you know, out by the old gravel pit, about 10 miles past that, out in the boonies. And she started whispering and she said to me, let me tell you about the legend of the skinwalker. And after she finished telling me that, she said, never talk about it. Because if you do, something very bad can happen. And I could tell by her facial expression, she was serious. And I have never been able to forget about it. Just because I didn't see it doesn't mean that it's still not stuck in my mind that sound. I've always wondered what it was. I never heard it again. And I ended up moving about 11 years later to Missouri, and that's where I live now, but nothing's ever happened here yet. That's my story, and I hope you can use them, Derek. I enjoy your podcast tremendously. Thank you. Thank you, Dee Dee. Two amazing entries. Now let's begin with the eerie growl Dee Dee described. Now given the location, any number of large animals present could be capable of making similar sounds. But if Dee Dee didn't recognize it, then we have to take her for her word. So then, again, given the location, I can't help but notice that we're in Wisconsin farm country. And that is a place known to be the home of an eight-foot bipedal canine monster many call the Beast of Bray Road. You know, if you're looking for a monster to pin it on, there's your perfect scapegoat. But let's focus back to the UFO part of the story. I did some digging online, hoping to find some mention of a late summer UFO experience in or around Fort Wayne in 1967. I figured if so many people had witnessed it, surely someone had to have spoken about it. Now I was a bit surprised to find nothing, although there may be old newspaper or radio reports that I simply don't have access to. But the search wasn't a total wash. I was able to find the following experience that took place in Fort Wayne, Indiana, exactly 10 years from the time of Dee Dee's sighting. Now, the following entry was published on UFO Sentinel on April 3rd, 2014. Growing up on a farm 15 miles outside of Fort Wayne, you really have a good sense of what's going on around you due to the very quiet nature of the area. When something happens, you know. Well, one night in 1977, I knew something was happening. I was 18 at the time. I woke up from a deep sleep, just knowing something was going on. There was no sound or anything like that, just a deep sense that there was something I needed to be aware of. I got out of bed and went downstairs. I had a baseball bat with me, just in case. There was nothing downstairs, so I went outside. That's when I got the shock of my life. Right in our front yard was what was obviously an alien spaceship, a flying saucer UFO, right in our front yard. I ran back inside, locked the door, and ran into the kitchen, where I had a view of the front yard. The saucer was still there, but it now had a bunch of lights lit that weren't on before. A few seconds later, it shot straight up into the sky, faster than my eyes could follow. I never saw another UFO after that incident. I don't want to give out the exact location since my sister lives in that house today with her family and I wouldn't want to scare them. I never told anyone what happened that night. I kept it to myself, not to scare people. Posted anonymously. 
And now I'll be frank. This is dated the same year that the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind was released in theaters. And although it's been a while since I've seen the film, I believe it opens with a child waking up to find a UFO in his yard. Now I'm not saying that the person that submitted the entry made it up, but we should consider it may have been influenced by the film. Although I think it's fairly important to point out that Close Encounters of the Third Kind wasn't released until mid-November of that year, 1977. Now this anonymous source does not give a time of year for this experience, so glean from that what you will. So assuming the entry wasn't inspired by Spielberg himself, is there something otherworldly that takes place in that part of Indiana every 10 years? Now I wasn't able to find any events from 87, 97, 2007, or 2017, but that certainly doesn't mean that they're not out there. Now thanks again, Didi, for sharing the entry. And thank you, the listener, for all the continued support. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us Beyond is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And the terrifying score that you hear, well, it's co.he music and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being a Patreon subscriber. And please, have a great night. <laughs>